Well, uh, Miigwech, uh, Buju, Jacob Jurs, Nindijana Kaz. Uh, thank you for that that welcome and and hello everyone. Welcome. I'm looking forward to to this and looking forward to your questions. Uh, yes, my, my name is uh, Professor Jacob Jurs, and I'm currently a faculty member at uh, Century Community College. It's a member of the Minnesota State uh, System. Uh, Miigwech, and uh, thank you for for welcoming me to to you all at least virtually. I'm looking forward to our conversations. But before I dive further into tonight's talk, I think it's important that you hear a little bit more about my background, uh, because I, I think I'm largely, to, to many of you, a, a stranger. Um, I do not have a dotem. I'm a non-native man. I was born and raised in Wisconsin, and I live in St. Paul with my wife and son, who are White Earth Ojibwe descendants. Uh, so I've got a, a picture here. I think my slides are showing up now. Um, this is my family. Uh, we have uh, Nokomis, Leah's grandmother, uh, on uh, sitting here. Uh, my son, Theodore, my wife, and Theo's uh, grandma, jo Joanne. Um, Theo's great-grandma, uh, Germaine, is, uh, is uh, Regert, stemming from the Brays and Bisons uh, of White Earth. Uh, she served White Earth in a variety of roles, including tribal council. And this past year was the first year that our son Theo was able to dance at powwow. As he grows, I know that he will learn about his relationship to the land and that it goes as far back as can possibly can go through his mother's line. Uh, but from my side, he's inheriting a different legacy, a legacy of immigrants and settlers who come from parts of Europe, including Germany, the Netherlands, uh, Bohemia, England, all, all, all other parts as well. Um, a story that we've lost in some ways. As he grows, I'm, I imagine he's going to have some questions about his own identity, like where does he get this blonde hair from? I don't know. Um, but he's going to also question where he fits in a larger narrative of, of Minnesota, um, but also his, his heritage as an Ojibwe man. I know there are questions that I'm struggling with uh, raising him uh, as a non-Native person, as well as a person who's a part of this, this history of this space. And so I'm here in part tonight because I am a historian. I've had the opportunity to be trained and teach at numerous institutions of higher learning across the Midwest. I completed my undergraduate degree at the University of Wisconsin-Madison before completing my PhD in history at Michigan State, uh, where I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Susan Sleeper-Smith. There, my research focused on Dakota and Ojibwe relations during the 18th and 19th century and how those relations impacted negotiations with the United States during the treaty era. And that's what we're going to be looking at in more detail tonight. So a uh, brief background. At the same time, my now wife uh, was, Leah, was taking classes at Michigan State to become a lawyer in Indigenous law. Following our formal education, we spent a year in South Dakota before coming home to Minnesota, where I've worked at a variety of institutions before my current position here at Century. I often feel inadequate to talk about this history especially in the presence of elders who have lived and feel this history in a way I can. There are deep flaws in academia. I know I'm a part of them. It has functioned as an exploitative enterprise, and it's often dismissive of Indigenous knowledge uh, and ways of knowing. So I start my classes in a similar way of how I'd like to start now, and that is primarily with the fact that despite of what historians often would like to say, I don't know everything. And while I have attended talks and presentations from elders who have been willing to share their knowledge, such knowledge does not always merge well with a non-Native classroom. What I can say for certain and, and where my research finds it, its niche is in the relations between Indigenous peoples and the United States federal government. And in that relationship, Grand Portage, um, where I was giving a talk just this past week, and other nations are sovereign nations. They're federally recognized, they maintain treaties with the United States. The rights that are reserved in the treaties were not, as sometimes non-Native individuals believe, given to the tribe. They're not paid in some kind of way. They're not some sort of form of restorative justice or reparations, but they were rights that the tribes had and had reserved for the entire community when making treaties. So some of you know of the 1854 treaty. There have been talks and presentations on this. That treaty reserved the right to hunt and fish throughout the Grand Portage Treaty lands. These rights have been defended in litigation and agreements with the state of Minnesota and the federal government. I believe there are some who are more knowledgeable than me who have delivered talks and presentations on this history, as well as that litigation. 
um, within the specific region to Indian country. What I hope today is to weave those specifics that you may know and the knowledge that many of you already have into a broader narrative of indigenous relations with the United States in order to better understand how our contemporary world functions primarily within the foundations of federal Indian law. The rights of hunting and fishing and often, are often the most visible treaty rights, but they point to a deeper obligation. And I, I find that worth exploring. So I've studied and taught indigenous and US history for the last decade, and I've ranged through a host of emotions when I do it. These emotions can often drive action, but it's action that at times can feel directionless. It feels hotly generated, but without sustainable mo momentum. Inequality and historical injustice are difficult to root out because they're often difficult to see. It's hard to see the entirety of these structures. However, scholars are increasingly paying attention and modeling how institutional racism has been baked into our society. Depending on who you are, these structures may be perfectly obvious. You encounter them on a daily basis. Or perhaps you're fortunate enough to move about your day never recognizing the barriers that surround you. But these barriers remain for millions of people all the same. So when I think about this, when I talk about this in my classroom, I liken it to the structures of a building. Uh, the building has walls, it has floors, it has lighting, all the visible aspects of a structure. And we don't necessarily think about, well, why are those walls where they are? Uh, how does that lighting actually work? Um, a light switch is, is, is thrown and the lights come on. It's often not until something goes wrong, the light burns out, or like we watch renovation shows, right? To, to relax at night on HGTV, you see someone uh, trying to remove a load bearing wall and all of a sudden they begin to peel back uh, what's not always in the top of their mind. Oh my gosh, we can't do that. But it's influencing us all the same. And without the blueprints, they often don't have those blueprints. It's hard to model the structure. So in a similar manner, trying to bring this forward, what I see is that history is shaping our present. It's a shape that can mold how other people see us, interact with us, how we see ourselves. Structural inequality and institutional racism, they're insidious. Because like a new homeowner moving into a new house, people with the best intentions may wish to change a system, but they fail because they underestimate how rooted such structures are. They have a lack of funds, or they have the realization that perhaps the entire structure is so rotten it has to be pulled down and rebuilt if the desired effects are to be achieved. Likewise, we live in a system, and while we might wanna change it without any historical understanding, we don't have the blueprints for systemic change. Without peeling back those layers, we're risking putting new paint on a deteriorating building. But history can help us with some of those blueprints. What I hope to do through this lecture series, and this is going to be part one, there's going to be two more, I encourage you to check out if this is of interest to you, is to show you how I've assembled this in at least my mind, and to see, well, what's missing from, from all of you? What, what, what feedback do you have? What knowledge do you have to bring to these blueprints? And how can we share this knowledge more widely? So then I begin, well, how do we get to this point? Where do we begin this exploration uh, of history? Each of us has come to this talk with a wide variety of pre-knowledge on this subject. So I find that it's important to start with definitions. Where am I coming from? So that I'm clear with some of the terms I'm using. Throughout this talk, I'm gonna be talking to the first peoples of what's known as North America now. I'm gonna be using terms like indigenous, native, Native American, or American Indian, with a full understanding that each term is flawed and incomplete. Ideally, and when possible, I'll use tribal designations, uh, i.e. Ojibwe and Anishinaabe, with the understanding that even this concept of tribe could be viewed as a historical construction. What I have here is from the Native American Journalists Association, and they give a definition on how reporters might be able to use uh, terms responsibly. And of course, each individual is going to have a preference for what terms that they use, but generally, this is how we're going to re refer to the indigenous peoples of North America. The next concept that I think is important is sovereignty. What is sovereignty? There are currently 574, and I think they will soon be 578, uh, federally recognized tribes by the United States federal government who also recognize their sovereignty. Each of these tribes is a sovereign entity. The scholar David Wilkins argues that the concept of sovereignty, though, is a Western legal construct. And he explains that it's the belief that state governments are the ultimate legal authority onto themselves. They have a government that protects and limits personal freedoms by social control. 
Now, the social control could be achieved through a variety of means. It could come from many different kinds of social, political, and economic structures. When scholars are writing about sovereignty of tribes in the current American legal context, this is the kind of sovereignty that they're referencing. But Wilkins believes that tribal sovereignty should be concerned more broadly with the, quote, the spiritual, moral, and dynamic cultural force within a given tribal community, empowering the group towards political, economic, and most important, cultural integrity, and towards a maturity in the group's relationship with its own members, with other peoples and their governments, and with the environment, an even more broad and all-encompassing idea. Tribes have always been sovereign. They didn't receive their sovereignty from the United States or Great Britain or France or the Dutch. It's innate, it's always existed. When indigenous people first discovered Europeans on their lands, they decided to incorporate them oftentimes into indigenous social and political structures. Indigenous communities had a very long history of diplomacy and treaty making before they discovered these Europeans on their shores. While Europeans sought to control their relations with native groups, Early on, they were rarely in the position to do so. And that comes to the last concept I want to begin with, and that of the indigenous borderlands. This is what my research is um, concerned with, in part because I researched the nature of relations prior to American attempts at asserting their authority in the Great Lakes. And what I found was that the Americans are encountering this borderland region between themselves and what they perceived as Western tribes. But they also were trying to assert power over an indigenous borderland. This borderland has everything to do with relationships. The indigenous borderlands were made up of living relational networks between individual, land, the spiritual and natural worlds. These overlapping connections ensured access to life-sustaining gifts of the world that were sometimes shared through overlapping spaces of utilization between peoples. In the Western Great Lakes, this borderland bridged and created divides between Dakota and Ojibwe peoples. Exploring these indigenous borderlands gives us some more insight into later interactions with the American treaty negotiators. Much of what Minnesota is today consists of Dakota homelands. Of course, Ojibwe oral tradition maintains a multi-generational migration narrative that helps explain how the Ojibwe people came to be in the lands at the edge of the Western Great Lakes. They came to the place where food grew upon water, Manolman. In the years after this journey, Sometime around 1650, an Ojibwe community established what became one of the largest village sites on the shores of Lake Superior called The Point. While there's no single capital uh, of the Anishinaabe, that's, that's not how we were to think of this political structure, there are important village sites where the communities would often gather in these large groups. La Point is one of those sites, and it becomes one of the largest Anishinaabe villages on the western edge of Lake Superior. So, as we look into the primary sources, we might look at William Warren, who's of mixed Ojibwe and European heritage. He's a 19th century historian, collecting oral histories uh, from all the leaders in his community. And he's giving us some additional insight into La Pointe. He writes in his history of Ojibwe people that, quote, for a number of years, the Ojibwe continued to continue, consider the Bay of La Pointe as their common home and their hunting parties returned thither at different seasons of the year. Warren notes that this is a small slice of Jiboy life, and he's noting it because there's a lead up to peace accords between the Dakota communities and Western located Ojibwe. See, these Ojibwe hunters, they're, they're based at this Western edge of Lake Superior, and they're traveling into points further West and South to hunt. And they're increasingly coming into conflict with Dakota hunters. To resolve these conflicts over the winter of 1678 to 79, there's a series of diplomatic talks that are held between the Ojibwe and Dakota. And we know about this in part because the French fur trader Grayson Delute was present at some of these discussions. And he, based on these writings, he often places himself at the center of these talks. And historians have likely overstated, well, the effectiveness of his presence on these negotiations. Ojibwe historian Michael Wicken argues that instead we should view these as two indigenous nations negotiating for their own reasons. They're only using the French and Duluth when it suits their own purposes. He points out that the Ojibwe and Dakota had been working for this peace and meeting outside of, of the more ceremonial talks that Duluth attended. Instead, he notes that there are indigenous specific reasons explaining the Ojibwe and Dakota peace accords of 1679. Geopolitically, the Meswaki Sauk Nation were living further to the south in what's in now Wisconsin. 
and their growing concern for both the Ojibwe and Dakota. By allying their two communities together, they could safely turn their focus on the Meswaki and Sauk. That's exactly what happens following 1679. They expanded access to fur trading options for the Dakota and also secured peace in these borderlands between peoples. And the peace that results from these accords, it holds. It holds until the end of what's called the Fox Wars around 1733. What flourishes in the intervening years is this indigenous borderlands between these communities. They have increasingly peaceful intertribal relations, and there's even intermarriage between these groups that increases this cross-cultural sharing. What likely existed in what we call uh, Minnesota was this amount uh, of alliance and accepted shared access to resources that were needed by both communities. So we turned towards marriage, and we could think about marriage cementing alliances between European aristocrats. Indigenous marriage did a similar thing. They helped solidify these connections between communities. And while diplomacy was likely for some of these unions, the frequency with which we see these unions also makes it reasonable to assume that, well, affection, feelings like love that historians don't always talk about, contributed to these. And again, we look at Warren's writings, and he seems to confirm this, noting that following the breakdown of relations between the Ojibwe and Dakota in the 1730s, mixed Ojibwe and Dakota families were forced to separate. In quoting Warren, he writes, instances were told where the parting between husband and wife was the most grieving to behold. Adding to this note of Warren on the anguish feelings of separation is how the Ojibwe dotum structure was shaped during this time. During this time, according to Warren, an Ojibwe child would inherit their dotum from their father's side. And Warren notes that there were so many children born of Dakota and Ojibwe relations that there needed to be a new dotum that was created in order to incorporate the children from the marriages who might have a Dakota uh, father, but then were living with their Ojibwe mother. And this becomes the wolf dotum, according to Warren. And the wolf dotum becomes notable throughout the St. Croix River region. And of course, that's a region that flows right through the heart of this indigenous borderlands between the Ojibwe and Dakota. And it's a dotum that comes up often, uh, even to this day. The Ojibwe who first moved their homes onto Sandy Lake region are coming from uh, villages that are originally located on the shores of Lake Superior, but they're not ending up in this space by mere chance. The waters surrounding Sandy Lake form an important liquid borderland. So not only do we have a relational borderland, but we have these linkages, these waterways, these passages that people are bumping into and flowing goods out of. A paddler could come from Lake Superior they could follow the western direction of the St. Louis River, go to the East Savannah River. There's a vital portage there that could next the paddlers between the West Savannah to Sandy Lake. And from the waters of Sandy Lake, you could continue on to the Mississippi and to hundreds of tributaries from there. The importance of places like Sandy Lake linking these waterways between Lake Superior and the Mississippi River is further reflected by the fur trade. Fur trading posts are established there in 1794 and occupied throughout the 1800s. The Sandy Lake region had been Dakota space, but it becomes Ojibwe space, and it links these key waterways between the Great Lakes and Mississippi River. It becomes this geological, this place, this meeting zone between Dakota and Ojibwe peoples. And so when historians talk about this, uh, when fur traders are talking about this, they're emphasizing hunting and trapping in this space. And certainly that is propelling Ojibwe people into here. A lot has been written about the pull of global markets for beaver furs. But I think we also need to look at micro level forces um, that are at work and key immediate concerns for this. Two items with a great impact in this space between the Dakota and the Ojibwe are the key resource of wild rice and maple sugar, really the gifts of wild rice and maple sugar because they help continue survival. We know that winter, it's coming, in Minnesota can be harsh. And writing in 1840, uh, we turn to another primary source, American agent C.C. Trollbridge, who's writing back to Lewis Cass on the regional conditions, stating that the Ojibwe lived on, quote, small acorn or beech nuts to make it through winter. The report states that the extreme winter weather could cause starvation that affected, quote, whole lodges, say 30 or 40 at a time. This has actually taken place in the Fond du Lac County Lake Superior with a few years past. 
to combat the specter of winter, communities needed to work early in the season to ensure that there was enough food was available. And stored properly, wild rice and maple sugar could last for months. They could provide these essential calories. But intimately tied to these gifts of the natural world is an understanding of a reciprocal relationship. So this uh, scholar, Heidi Stark, uh, Ojibwe scholar, has noted examples of treaty relations between humans and non-human entities that should be exemplified, that human beings should follow. In her research, she tells a story of the woman who married a beaver. She explains that one day, a young woman was undergoing her fast when she came upon a young man who had asked her for her hand in marriage. She agrees with this young man and goes to live with her new husband. And he's an excellent provider. He's giving everything that she could possibly want. And they have several children together. The woman notes that the young man often returned with items that are used in trapping and eating a beaver. But she doesn't think deeply about it until one day when he doesn't return home. It seems like he has died. So after a period of time, she returns to her family. And as she is making this return trip, she realizes that she had actually married a beaver who had been sacrificing himself daily and bringing these trade goods back to her. And so she tells her village that they always have to bring the beaver remains back to the water so that after they are done, the beaver could continue to return to the community. Stark, taking this story, argues that this is a form of a treaty relationship. It's a form of a treaty between the beaver and the Anishinaabe community. And this reciprocal relationship where they are both gaining from it, where they are both respecting e each other, it's based on a deep respect for each other. And that's how one should engage in treaties. It has to be renewed constantly. And there has to be that baseline of respect. In a similar manner, the wild rice beds and maple sugar groves are an important location to consider power dynamics but also this reciprocal treaty relationship. While men were often but not always hunters and trappers, women were the ones often controlling and directing wild rice and sugar harvests of at least the 18th century. Part of a woman's role during this time was to maintain that proper relationship between the community and importantly between the gifts of the Manado, including wild rice and maple sugar. That meant that for Anishinaabe communities, wild rice and maple sugar were more than a necessary resource for for survival, but they're gifts of the natural world. And they're seeking a reciprocal relationship with all the people. There's a connection here between water, women, life, rebirth, and spring. And it's important to note this is a sacred connection. Protecting this relationship is part of then a treaty relationship. It's everything surrounding it between humans and the greater world. Women were in charge of the sacred relationship and they're in charge of organizing this harvest. It's not something that's written on paper. A treaty relationship is your actions. That's what you continue to do. In the instances of sugar bush locations, women maintained individual usage plots. Europeans often thought, well, indigenous people don't understand private property. That's, that's not true. Women had their own personal property. They had plots that they would use. The sugar bush locations were passed down from mothers to daughter, along with the tools and materials necessary to harvest that sap. If a family didn't have a sugar bush, they could even petition the community council for access, as long as you received permission for the harvest. Women also controlled who would access to certain wild rice locations, and they would mark their sections by tying colored cloth to the stalks. While hunting could provide some of the meat for the community, and the resulting furs could be engaged in this fur trade, and so these gathered resources. It's the wild rice, it's the maple sugar, it's berries along with fishing that's really going to ensure communities. That's where power lied, with women. And so yes, hunting, gathering are essential activities. They ensure community survival, but they are linked to these treaties of reciprocal respect with the gifts of the natural world in order to live the good life. So it's into these indigenous homelands, it's into these indigenous borderlands that Europeans were discovered by Anishinaabe communities during the 16 and 1700s. As these Europeans are gaining a foothold in North America, they're attempting to remake this relationship. They're beginning to try to build different structures that privilege their existence, their understanding of society. And they're gonna justify the shift in relational ties in a variety of ways. But one of the most important for them is reliance on what we now know as the doctrine of discovery. And this is a concept that underpins much of federal Indian law today. 
Europeans relied on the doctrine of discovery as one of their earliest justifications for taking, colonizing, and administrating over native land. This concept doesn't come from a single source, but it has roots in several papal bulls, teachings of the Catholic Church encyclicals, and common law practices of Europeans stemming from the 1400s. During and in the aftermath of the Crusades, any non-Christian was viewed as an enemy of the church and thus subhuman. In 1452, Pope Nicholas V issued a papal bull that allowed the King Alfonso of Portugal to, quote, capture, vanquish, and subdue the sacraments, pagans, and other enemies of Christ, to put them into perpetual slavery, and to take all their possessions and property. Portugal used this papal directive as a justification for their explorations, quote unquote, of the subcontinent of Africa and their participation in the enslavement of African peoples. Following the voyage of Columbus, Pope Alexander VI then issued uh, a further on May 4th, 1493, which among other things divided the lands of North, Central, and South America between Spain, Portugal, and authorizing the kingdoms to colonize their respective regions. The Gilder Lehman Institute of American History notes that the Bulls stated any lands not inhabited by Christians was available to be discovered, claimed and exploited by the Christian rulers, and declared that now, and I'm quoting the Bull itself here, the Catholic faith and Christian religion be exalted and be everywhere increased and spread, that the health of souls be cared for, and that the barbarous nations be overthrown and brought to faith itself. Pope Alexander VI decreed that the land previously undiscovered by Europeans become the exclusive property of these European nations who discovered them. And of course, discovery meaning the first European to claim a specific piece of land as indigenous peoples who had lived in their homes for thousands of years. The Europeans invoked discovery were not overly concerned whether or not indigenous peoples had made any claims. Rather, those claims were papered over as being held in quote unquote Indian title a right of indigenous people to perhaps occupancy, but not ownership. This twisted logic is built on a Eurocentric and Eurosupremacist view that didn't allow for indigenous peoples to be fully understood as human beings. So then what follows is that if they're not fully human and they could not possess the full rights of white European men, indigenous occupancy of land could only be tolerated as long as it was beneficial for European colonial goals. And so that relationship, if it's no longer working for Europeans, then the benefit of the land is far more valuable. And so Europeans and later Americans would begin to seek to extinguish indigenous occupancy through treaty or more often genocidal wars. The doctrine of discovery is underpinned by a logic informed by racist Eurocentric views as completely at odds with the logic informing the indigenous ways of knowing and existing. And it's not until March of 2023 that the Catholic Church formally stated that the papal bulls supporting this doctrine of discovery had been, quote, manipulated, unquote, for political purposes. While in statements of the announcement, the church noted that the papal bulls had been nullified in the 1530s, this had done little to abrogate the justification for European colonization. Indeed, United States history itself is deeply tied to this doctrine of discovery and the justification it's going to provide for the federal land grabs. It becomes a foundation for the cornerstone of federal Indian law. And through the first three decisions that are gonna be made by Chief Justice John Marshall in 1823, and cited by the Supreme Court as late as 2005 by uh, late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. From the European justifications of this land bed come the origins of the United States and its push for independence. Now, taxes, political representation, and this squishy concept of freedom are often cited as the key propellants of the American Revolution. But one of the causes of the American Revolution that receives far less attention centers on the American colonists' desire to expand settlements between, beyond what's called the Proclamation Line of 1763. This proclamation was issued by the British King George, who had banned American settlers from moving west of the Appalachian Mountains. The British Crown had found that the expense of maintaining troops along the Appalachian Mount Mountains uh, made it cross prohibitive. As American colonists had trespassed into the fertile lands of the Ohio River Valley, they stirred conflicts with indigenous nations, and then they forced the British government to demand military protection. So after fighting the Seven Years' War, or the French and Indian War, the king balked at supporting such an expensive enterprise. 
and Parliament argued that the colonists needed to pay their fair share to support their military actions. So they started these tax increases. Meanwhile, the king is passing this proclamation line of 1763, banning American colonists from going into the Appalachian Mountains. This is angering these settlers, but it's also angering land speculators, including men like George Washington. The grievous grievances over these skirmishes along the western edge of the colonies find its way into the 27th grievance of the Declaration of Independence. It states that the king has, quote, excited domestic insurrection among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Domestic insurrection in, in this piece is referring to the, the revolts of liberation by enslaved Africans, while the second part of this 27th grievance is relating to the increased resistance of tribes within the Ohio River Valley and Southern Appalachia, who at the time were resisting American colonists invading their lands. But following the American Revolution, the self-proclaimed Americans sought to design a new government. And the designs of their government begin to betray their concern over relations with American Indian life, tribes. The 27th grievance of the Declaration of Independence betrays what had been called the original sins of the United States, these twin sins of slavery and the genocidal policies of settler colonialism that later contribute to violent forced removal of indigenous peoples. The Americans created legal instruments to aid their goals, and this could be seen in some of our most foundational government structures. Earliest attempts to form a national government became known as these Articles of Confederation. It's an agreement, a, a banding together of these newly independent states in a loose confederation. Overall, the articles are largely unsatisfactory, but there is one achievement, and that's the Northwest Ordinance. The first war version of this Northwest Ordinance is passed in 1784, and it's followed by revisions in 1785 and 87. Now, at that time, there were several states who had claimed land in this region that becomes known as uh, the Northwest Territory, including Minnesota. In the Ordinance of 87, Congress created an outline of how states would be made out of this and join the Union. But it also addresses American Indian tribes, quote, the utmost good faith shall always be observed towards Indians. Their lands and property shall never be taken from them without their consent. And in their property, rights, and liberty, they never shall be invaded or disturbed unless in just and lawful wars authorized by Congress. But laws founded in justice and humanity from time to time be made for preventing wrongs being done to them, for preser preserving peace and friendship with them. Beautiful words, great foundation. And it's one that it almost immediately comes into question after it's passed. The Articles of Confederation allow for the creation of this momentous piece of legislation, but they're largely weak and an ineffective governing tool. And the satisfaction um, led to the assembling of the Constitutional Convention. Now, embedded in the Constitution are several aspects related to tribes, including the Indian Commerce Clause. Following the passage of this constitution and the election of President George Washington, he appoints Henry Knox to the position of Secretary of War. And the Washington administration begins working to consolidate power, particularly power in the executive branch to engage with native nations. They're centralizing power to aid the early republic's goal of land expansion. Washington himself is keenly aware of the benefits of expanding territory. His previous work was as a land surveyor. Yes, he was a military general, but before that, he understood land, and he speculated in land, and he understood what kind of wealth could be generated if only these indigenous lands, these borderlands, could then be turned into property, property that could be taxed, property that could be turned into farmsteads, that could generate more wealth. Washington's administration saw these financial benefits in attaining this title to indigenous lands and selling it back to settlers. The proceeds would be used to pay down wartime debts, including debts owed to soldiers in Washington's army. It, this built the early economy of the Americans. And through these payments, um, many ended up in the hands of speculators. So in order to do this, they're going to use treaties and negotiations, diplomatic relations. They're all things that tribal leaders are apt at, they're familiar with, they've been using. But as we've noted earlier, treaties for these indigenous leaders were not just the words written down in paper. But in entering into these negotiations, the United States, uh, they did not see that they were entering into a sacred relationship that was cementing ties between peoples. 
They did not see that the events, the speeches recorded in the treaty minutes, the diplomatic protocols, the ceremonies, those are all supposed to be used to strengthen these ties, uh, to show that the treaties aren't dead documents. Treaties and indigenous diplomacy are the confirmation of the relationship. It's something to be periodically renewed, refreshed, based on this mutual respect for each other. But the United States is looking to re-envision this process and tie it much more closely to an Anglo-American jurisprudence heritage that increasingly places more emphasis on the written agreement over the verbal or ceremonial. And some American leaders like Thomas Jefferson believed that these negotiations would be the most beneficial way for all parties to engage. But Jefferson thought it would only be beneficial if native communities accepted his vision of proper social structures. Jefferson argued that once tribal members became farmers, they'd be willing to trade with the United States for farming implements. But this trade had an insidious goal. And so Jefferson is writing to William Henry Harrison, uh, who's in Indiana at the time. They believed that Native Americans would be, quote, willing to par off lands from time to time in exchange for necessities for their farms and families. If that didn't work quickly enough, Jefferson believed the United States could use trading posts to drive, quote, good and influential individuals into debt. Then during treaty councils, these individuals would be more willing to pay down those debts through land secessions. And this is something that actually happens. It becomes an early strategy of treaty commissioners during treaty councils. During this early period between Europeans and indigenous nations, native pro protocols often were the procedures. But by the turn of the 19th century, the U.S. is seeking a revision, and that revision is taking direction from American officials. And they are seeking to move from this sacred relationship into this Eurocentric understanding that now underpins much of international law. They are forcing to make their conceptions of what a treaty relationship is by ignoring any other res uh, responsibilities. I don't respect the partners that they are working with. Following the War of 1812, the growing American Republic believed that the Western Great Lakes were rightfully theirs. During the war, many Western Great Lakes villages, including several Dakota and Ojibwe, had sided with the British. Some had sided with the Americans. Many more washed their hands of it, and so this looks like it's a war between brothers. But following the war and through the 1840s, the Americans were concerned that the British were infiltrating Native American communities. And this prompts repeated American drives for negotiation with Great Lakes tribes. They're also, the Americans are very interested in the lands of the Great Lakes and the resources they represented to them. They want to not only take the resources like timber, uh, like the furs, but they wanna commodify the land. And the idea of commodifying the land is to break that relationship, that reciprocal relationship and turn it into private property that you can gain profit from. But the Americans are running into several problems with the Dakota and Ojibwe. There's not a single leader who contr commands control of anyone. Um, that means it's hard to have a unified military opposition, but that decentralized nature of tribal governance also frustrated American attempts to assert their authority over the region. And so American authority is largely limited in the Great Lakes. But the 1820s become a pivotal moment in this shifting relationship, and it's coming out of the Supreme Court cases. There are three, and I think we'll finish with that today. One in 1823, one in 1831, and one in 1832. In 1823, the Supreme Court was presented with a case, and it questioned whether or not a non-Native individual could purchase lands directly from American Indian tribes, or if the right to purchase the land lay solely with the federal government. Supreme Court Justice John Marshall wrote the majority opinion in Johnson v. McIntosh. At the heart of this dispute was whether the U.S. government would recognize the legitimacy of land sales conducted between individuals and tribes, or whether only sales the federal government could be recognized. Marshall concluded that the federal government had the sole authority. They were the only ones who could purchase land from indigenous nations. He argued the federal government was the primary entity responsible for engagement with tribal nations. And he bases this on a variety of jurisprudence principles from the U.S. Constitution to English common law and early iterations of international law. But he is also basing this on the discovery doctrine. And he argues that European nations, quote, established a principle which all should acknowledge as law by the right of acquisition, which they all assented, should be regulated as between themselves. This principle was the 
that discovery gave title to the government by whose subject or by whose authority it was made against all other European governments, which title might be consummated by possession, the do doctrine of discovery. Ultimately, he ruled that indigenous nations couldn't sell their land to individuals, but it's the United States who inherits the right of first refusal of any lands to the doctrine of discovery. In 1830, the United States Congress then passes a bill known as the Indian Removal Act. In response, Cherokee Nation uses a variety of tactics to try to delay and avoid their own removal, petitioning the United States Supreme Court in two different cases. The first comes in 1831, and it's called Cherokee Nation v. Georgia. During the 1820s, Georgia had attempted to enforce its laws in Cherokee territory. And the Cherokee Nation filed suit attempting to prevent Georgia from doing so. However, rather than ruling on the merits of the case, John Marshall again argues infamously that Cherokee Nation couldn't even bring the suit because rather than a foreign nation, tribes were, quote, domestic dependent nations. And he defines that the proper role of tribes and the federal government is like a ward to its guardian. And so this sets up the final case. This sharpens the understanding of the relationship in 1832. As part of the attempt to restrict the Cherokee Nation, the state of Georgia had demanded that any non-Native person going into Cherokee lands deliver a loyalty oath to Georgia. And missionary Reverend Samuel Worcester refused, and he's promptly arrested. And the case is filed in his behalf, and it argues that Georgia law had no place in Cherokee Nation. They could not put their laws in this place. And so it comes back up to the Supreme Court to decide what is the proper role of state law, the federal government, and American Indian tribes. Marshall uh, looks at this and he considers um, the actual question. He doesn't push it off on a technicality. And he writes, in matters dealing with Indian nations, the law of the state must give way to federal law. And this becomes a, a resounding victory for tribes but it has little impact because it's after this case that President Andrew Jackson uh, utters his infamous statement, perhaps apocryphally, that quote, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. But this Marshall trilogy of federal Indian law cases, these three cases, along with the US Constitution and Doctrine of Discovery, they set up the foundation for what becomes federal Indian law. And it's a legacy that continues to impact tribes all the way to this day the federal government continues to view its land claims as legitimized through this discovery doctrine and the treaties that it makes with, with tribes. It rests its understanding of tribal legal, legal status on this Marshall Trilogy, arguing that tribes exist with the sovereignty, but it's a sovereignty that can be limited by the US Congress because of these tribes' statuses as domestic dependent nations. But it also recognizes this innate power of tribes that transcend states, unless of course Congress decides that it no longer wishes to recognize the sovereignty. As Marshall is using the courts to define this relationship between how he sees the proper government relations between the federal, state, and tribal nations, other Americans are turning their attention to the Great Lakes. Men like Michigan Territorial Governor Lewis Cass saw in their minds a region that's empty of organized state, states. It's void of borders. It doesn't have these property lines that are easy to commodify, that are easy to turn into governable and profitable homesteads. And to complete this vision, they want to take this doctrine of discovery, this constitution, and this trilogy, and turn this relational world that we described at the beginning into a transactional worldview. During the early 19th century, their transactional tool of choice is the treaty. But later on, they're going to use governmental statutes. They're going to use genocidal warfare. And they use force assimilation policies and acting through the boarding schools, termination policies, and 20th century relocation efforts. Lost in all this is this relational, this reciprocal and relational relationship based on mutual respect. So I'm going to have two more lectures uh, at the end of October and the beginning of November. And we're going to be tracing this history of the Indian Removal Act through these genocidal wars and the boarding schools. And we're going to take it all the way up to our current moment, where most recently, just this past June, the United States Supreme Court made a ruling in the Brockheen v. Holland case. And it decided to defend ICWA, the Indian Child Welfare Act. But it's an act that 
was never about children. It's all about tribal sovereignty, our tribe sovereign. What is the extent of, of that sovereignty? And it's a question that the courts continue to ask. Prior to the American arrival, Dakota and Ojibwe people populated this indigenous borderland. And they existed through these interpersonal relations between peoples and these gifts of this natural world. The treaty era with the United States shifted that relationship that sought to commodify territory and ultimately contributed to genocidal policies that attempted to eradicate all of these people, as well as this reciprocal relationship. I think back, uh, my wife and I were watching uh, Reservation Dogs last week, and they were talking about the last episode. Uh, it, was, it was the last, and the auntie is uh, speaking with, with her niece and is talking about community and the relations between community. And one of the goals of the federal government was to break those relations. It was to change them from this relational network, this support that you have, and turn it into this more transactional way. That's what it's meant by a destruction of indigenous culture. And so I'll leave you with, with, with this because I was uh, talking to my students earlier today. I had a class, we were talking boarding schools and it's a pretty heavy subject. And we're going to be talking about boarding schools in this next session. Um, but they looked and they're like, well, what do we do with this now? And I don't really have a good answer for it. I know that one, real change can come from authentic and reciprocal relationships. I think too, that these relationships have to be rooted in land. You have to have some connect connection to the space that you're in. And three, you choose what relationships you wanna be a part of, transactional or otherwise. So at the end, I think, well, what relationships do you wanna live in? How do you understand your relations, not only to yourself, family and community, but the space that surrounds you? So McWitch, thank you all for listening. I'm, I'm looking forward to our, our question session now. Professor Juris, we have not gotten any questions in the chat, which means that people must be excited to unmute themselves and ask questions. Uh, I'm gonna give you a minute though. As we settle in, I wanna remind people that we have Indigenous Peoples Day coming up uh, on Monday in Cook County, but we are celebrating that in Grand Portage on the 7th. So I will put into the chat some of the events that we have um, it's just going to be a wonderful day, and we're really grateful for our partners um, in Grand Portage that are hosting us. Anybody come up with their great questions? If so, you're welcome to unmute yourself, or you can put them in the chat, and I'm happy to read them off. You know, topics like this can be something that is really uh, a lot to take in and absorb as uh, we're learning maybe new things or things that maybe we've heard before, but only in, in pieces or um, don't have necessarily a strong memory of maybe learning in school. And so it can be a lot to be looking at, but um, it's so important for us to be taking time like this, to be learning together and refocusing on maybe history we did learn in the past, maybe didn't retain as well as we should have. That was a nice um, presentation. Thank you, Jacob. I was able to look up some things as you were talking on my phone, like where the, the where Sandy Lake was. I didn't know where that was. Or, um, so that was kind of fun to do that. But yeah, I thought it was a nice presentation. I'm looking forward to the next two. Thank you. Thank you. There's, there's a park there at, at Sandy Lake. There is a portage. Uh, we 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 were there just this um, the previous summer uh, lo looking at that space. Uh, I called it part of my research, but really we were just camping. We're starting to get some questions in the chat. Besides the future sessions and maybe those uh, reading resources that were mentioned, is there anything you'd recommend um, to learn more about the information that was covered tonight or dig deeper into some of those topics? Sure, the, the resources... Uh, the resources that I, I included in, in the PowerPoint uh, can be sent out. Uh, perhaps we can send it into an email. And if there are uh, specific aspects uh, of the history, because there, there are many books, but um, as far as a, a broad narrative, there, there's only a handful. Uh, Ned Blackhawk, he's a scholar at, at Yale. I, th I think maybe, it, yeah, yeah, it, 
he just came out with a, a brand new book. And I think it's actually in line uh, for either the National Book Award or it's shortlisted for something recently. I'll, I'll have to find it. But that is a, a more expansive um, story that might be of interest. Uh, yeah, there, and Blackhawk is, is in the chat. Uh, that would be a, a perfect book if you want a really broad overview. But if there are specifics, um, I, I think my email, email me directly and, and I could talk about of your interest. Well, and, and with that being said, there was somebody that was wanting to know a little bit more, more specifically about the Papal Bull Doctrine of Discovery. Um, would love to know more about that as a deeper dive at some point. Um, or if okay. there's anything more you'd like to specifically mention about that, no, you'd be welcome to. There, there is certainly a more, um, but 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 I'll say what, what what folks are often surprised is that there isn't a, a single teaching that is the doctrine of discovery, and and that's something I like to emphasize is that it's this whole collection of thoughts and teachings that are coming out and are related to the construction of the early modern world and globalization. It's it's a world history piece, and it's uh, impacted more than just North America. Uh, of course, this is setting off um, a whole colonization uh, of world history. Um, but yeah, I, I think I, I think it should be talked about more. I think that the church is certainly wrestling with, with, with its history, and it has come up almost apologized uh, for, for it. But then people often ask, well, then what, what's next? And there are some legal scholars who are thinking, well, if the doctrine of discovery were to go away on a practical term, it's not like the United States federal government is going to disappear. So what does it mean now? Where, where do we move from after 500 years of this colonization? Thank you for that. Somebody asked in the comments, uh, you made a comment earlier that hunting and fishing are the most viable tra tribal rights. Is that because they have been the impetus for some of the most successful lawsuits protecting treaty rights? And are there any pending lawsuits in the treaty area that aren't related to hunting and fishing? I know that there are some surrounding pipelines, but wanting to know more about those that are indirectly related to hunting and fishing. Sure, the, the hunting and fishing are, are the most clearly obvious. They are written out in, in the treaties. They are specifically highlighted um, most often. There are a handful of treaties that might list um, a particular tree. Um, water is rarely listed within the treaty rights. So litigators have to become a little bit more creative when they're looking at something like uh, pipelines and how that might be affecting uh, wild rice. It's a harder argument to make that a pipeline might, might affect a hunting or, or trapping right. But the leaking from pipelines can most certainly affect the type of water quality needed for wild rice. And so there's the, the legal argument that the United States not only needs to protect the right through its treaty obligations, but the ability uh, to have access. And part of that ability is ensuring that that environment isn't damaged. That actually brings us to a, a larger conversation about the concept of land back, uh, something that, that folks are talking about and pushing for. And what I've seen when I've had some guest speakers come into my classes is they say, we love this idea of land back and having land into indigenous hands but land back at what stage? Um, if the space has been polluted, um, whose obligation is it to clean that back? At what state does that land come back to a person? And I think of, of a place close to my home here in St. Paul, um, there's a location called uh, Wakan Tipi Cave. And it's a sacred place for the, for the Dakota. And these caves had been used uh, during the 19th century for brewers who were logging their lo lagering their beer, right? That's that's how you brew a, a lager. You need the cool temperatures, uh, and so there was beer and pollution within these caves. And then in the surrounding area from the 19th century into the 20th century, the railroads came in, and they had uh, shipping containers going back and forth, and sometimes leaking into this space. Well, there, there's a push of well, could this be land that reverts back into tribal held territory. Well, who's responsible for the heavy cleanup of what's really a super fun site um, during this time? What does that mean when we're talking about um, land back? What does it mean as it's tied to a treaty, right? 
Thank you for that. And I would mention um, in our region, um, the Curtis Ganya um, moose hunt, I know is one that was really pivotal for uh, some impact up here in our region. So I'll put that into the chat as well. Uh, one of the questions that came up here and here was talking about the idea of videos. Is there any recommended videos beyond the ones that CCHE has on our recordings that we sent out to you? Are there anything, um, I just know some people pr uh, prefer to learn that way versus maybe reading a book. So if you have any suggestions off the top of your head, otherwise we'll do a follow-up. Uh, vi videos, uh, something that is uh, quite easy to engage one is the We Shall Remain series from PBS. Uh, it's one that I think if people haven't seen it, it it's a great entry point. And it's a series of, of uh, five videos that go from the first uh, Thanksgiving all the way to Wounded Knee 2. Uh, in 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 the 1970s, um, and I think that's that's an excellent uh, series. It, it's getting a, a little bit dated, but it's uh, fairly accessible in, in most places. And then I do see uh, the question about uh, a book as well. Um, if you're looking at some of this dual nature of treaty thought uh, about um, Manado, about leadership, uh, Carrie Miller, she she's uh, an Ojibwe uh, scholar. Uh, who wrote a book called Ogama, um, leader, chief, lo loosely translated. And she she is where I'm drawing much of uh, my thoughts, um, thoughts uh, about the, this relationship. And so she would be one that I would turn to. It's, it's a fairly accessible book as well. I don't know if I have it right here. Oh, and The Murder of Joe White is quite good by Eric Redix. He's up in uh, Grand Portage. If you want to learn more about this area, and here's Carrie's book. I keep telling Eric he's got to do a presentation for us at some point on, on his book. So hopefully He's an excellent scholar. He should definitely he do it. And he actually did a series similar to what you're doing now. Um, we did that about three years ago, uh, and it was terrific. But we know that there's just continued voices uh, if we have different people teaching it. Sometimes we hear it and uh, the, what, have I heard the thing you have to hear it seven times before it sticks in your brain? Well, you know, hopefully not seven times of different workshops, but uh, maybe it, that's what it takes. Um, there was another question in here, uh, just thinking about, um, thanks for the well-crafted, organized and well-integrated intro to the foundation. So law, doctrine and discovery foundations of our interrelations. How should we do a follow-up for the lecture to build our own understanding? Anything you would suggest for that for individuals to do for their next steps besides maybe reading a book? You know, what one other one besides the the books and, and videos is exploring um, uh, the Glyphwick uh, site. That's the the Great Lakes uh, Fish and Wildlife. They have uh, excellent sources, particularly in in the Grand Portage area, Fond du Lac, uh, Northern Michigan, and, and Wisconsin. And they go through these treaty rights in a great deal more uh, of detail. And that's another way of engaging with this material. I said not meeting to material, but I gotta tell you, they actually have a really wonderful handbook that you can grab that is really short and sweet to read. Um, and it gives you a lot of details on treaty rights and information. Um, if you're looking for a short read that really details a lot of the information you might be seeking. Mm -hmm. I do invite you to unmute and, and chat if there's something that you're wanting to ask um, that way, if you'd prefer. No, I, I don't have any um, any questions, but just want to kind of share my gratitude, uh, Professor Juris, uh, for, for your kind of time here. And, and thank you, you know, Kelsey and, and Karen for, for organizing this session and, and Mary for, for bringing um, the professor up to up to Grand Portage, and I, I think it, this was just a, a wonderful, you know, a wonderful first lecture, and I'm really looking forward to um, to the follow up sessions. So, just a lot of lot, lot of gratitude for for taking the time to share share your knowledge. Thanks, sir. The next lecture, I'm I'm encouraging everyone to come, um, but in both, um, I, I, th these are. Twin lectures, they're not exactly the same as, uh, as was stated. Mary, Mary invited me up to, to Grand Portage, um, but they're, they're working in tandem together. 
And both of the next lectures are going to be a Zoom session. I'm not coming up. In, in part, it's my my son's uh, birthday is around that that lecture, so I want to be here uh, for for him. But the other part of it is the difficult nature uh, of the next lecture, and that is it, it, it's traumatic. Um, we will be talking about the boarding schools. Uh, I will be mentioning the Dawes Act. I will be talking about Wounded Knee, and so I I think it's something for folks to keep in mind that you can you've heard this, you can turn the screen off. But I also don't want to avoid this subject because of the impact that it then has in the 20th and 21st century, and because it is part of this larger narrative. A genocide has occurred in the United States, and we still have not fully acknowledged it or even begin to confront uh, with it. I know Canada has had their truth and reconciliation, and I have issues with, with that. Um, but how can you even begin to have reconciliation when the truth is still working its way out? We don't know the full extent of this history, and that will be something that I'll be bringing up in the next lecture. So I'm looking forward uh, to hopefully being in community with, with you all uh, via Zoom in our next session. And uh, if there are further questions, my email is a great way. I'm, I'm more than happy to continue to uh, respond via, via email, and that CenturyLink is, is the best way to reach out to me.